A high-speed ferry sets off from Hong Kong for its daily journey into Guangdong Province, China. It's heading for a city I've never even heard of, but which happens to be, this year anyway, on the wild frontier of the new global economy. Here, under a communist flag, officials are tempting foreign businessmen with talk of rich capitalist pickings. I hope more and more businessmen from Great Britain will come to invest here because we still have great potential for them to make profits here. Everybody talks about globalization these days, but few people do anything about it. Someone who is doing something is the British businessman Cliff Lua. Can I help you? Water. Okay, uh, I'm full. Cliff has devoted his life to polythene. He's traveling to his new factory in China. Yeah. Uh, two of those. Two, two cans of coke. Normally, he's the only non-Chinese passenger on the ferry. Hong Kong dollars. Oh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Come on. How many? A plain-spoken Derbyshire businessman 7,000 miles from home. You're English. <laughs> Better than my Chinese. I think you said a free. You just saw a Yeah? Yeah? Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So, how often have you made this trip now? This is um, 22, 23 times from the UK out to Zinghui, um, starting back in the early part of 1993. So this is your regular commute to work? It's become that way, yes, increasingly so. A bit different from the office Mondeo, I should imagine. Well, quite, quite different, quite different. The change for me, <clears throat> being a, a manager in industry in Britain, to have the opportunity to travel out here, to travel around the Far East initially, to decide where we should place this factory and to get to the point where we now have a successful factory. Never have dreamt of it. Never have thought it would have been something I would ever do. China has a magnetic, hypnotic effect on many British businessmen and it takes less than a day for Cliff to fly to Hong Kong and speed up the Pearl River into one of the fastest growing economic regions on the planet. We got off the ferry at Xinhui. By Chinese standards, it's a small boom town with just 800,000 people. Just on the right hand side here is the latest and greatest shopping plaza. There's a lot of new stuff going up at the moment, isn't there? An awful lot, yeah. It goes up very quickly. For us, 11 months from the first uh, hole in the ground to putting the electricity into the building. That's pretty good because you insisted on Western style standards, haven't you? We've pushed very hard for it to be built well, constructed properly. We've dragged people back regularly to redo where we weren't happy. In Guangdong province, new factories are going up at a staggering rate. Many are British. Britain is the leading European investor in China with over a thousand joint ventures already set up. British money is pouring in, but with it, British jobs. A Shropshire factory has closed with the loss of 150 jobs after the operation moved to China to cut labour costs. Now parent company British Polythene Industries will import plastic bags back into the UK for sale to major supermarket chains. On the outskirts of Zinhui, on land which was paddy field a year ago, sits the factory where those British jobs went and it tells you almost all you need to know about the global economy. Of course, Chinese people can be trained to make plastic bags as well as any British worker. A decade ago, that made little difference to anyone here or in China. Now it makes business sense for a British firm to build a factory in China, import the raw material, and ship the product back to Blighty. And that's very tough luck on the unemployed bag makers of Telford. Where do you get this raw polythene from? From uh, Saudi Arabia, from Malaysia, from Singapore. We've now got master bags being made locally here in China, although initially that came from the UK and from Hong Kong. And where are the machines from? The machines uh, are all European, some from Germany uh, and some from Denmark. Uh, virtually the same as we would have in the UK, brought here and uh, maintained in the same way. And I see that even the earplugs come from Brazil. Even the earplugs come from Brazil. This is totally international factory. Totally. 
But the miracle ingredient that lets this factory keep up with the competition is the price of labour. In China, the people who run the machines are paid far, far less than in the UK, and this substantially cuts British polythene's manufacturing costs. The saving on each bag is minuscule, a fraction of the penny each one costs to make, but it mounts up to a fortune as 21 million of them stream off the production line each week, and it allows British polythene to compete in a cutthroat market. People here earn between 1,300 and 2,000 remimbis per month for a 42-hour working week. And uh, that is a salary that covers their housing allowance, their food allowance. So that's about 100 pounds a month? The basic one is 100 pounds a month for the person who's laboring and sweeping up, going up as per the training they've, they've had. How does that compare with what you were paying workers doing similar job back in Britain? A worker in, a worker in the UK will receive ten times that amount. This is British Telecom's network switching centre, an electronic hub in the global economy. Unimaginable quantities of information are converted into pulses, pushed up into space and zapped instantaneously all over the globe. 1.3 trillion dollars is moved around the world by electronic blips every day. That's twice as much money as the major industrial nations keep in all their holdings. These days, mere governments are scarcely in the game. Increasingly, I think, borders are just disintegrating and that it's now possible to trade products across borders in ways that it wasn't possible 10 or 20 years ago. And for people to move across borders is so much easier. So there's no doubt in my mind that the world is moving to one international economy. A fantastic explosion in global communications is destroying the old political and economic borders which used to divide our world. In fact, the global market is now so powerful that it's forcing MPs and ministers to tear up their own rule books. It's reinventing the whole job of government. Our image of the world used to be a map covered in different colours, each clearly representing a separate nation-state. These days we see the planets blues and browns and whites swirling around. None of these true colours has anything to do with our sense of nationhood. You know, the question of who you are um, is a very important one because this will change, ought to change, because if you ask the Japanese, what are you? Uh, then uh, they would say, I'm a Japanese. Uh, secondly, I'm Ken Nomai. And uh, perhaps uh, five minutes later, you would say, yeah, I'm a global citizen. I think this will have to be completely reversed. We are the member of this uh, global uh, society. And so the global logic requires very transparent border and the disclosure of information, access from the individual to the best practice in the world. Eventually, that brings me uh, to me the best quality of life at the lowest cost possible. The lowest cost brings other costs with it. This machine is testing whether British plastic bags made in China will be strong enough for you to carry your Argentine beef, New Zealand wine and Kenyan beans across the car park to the Honda or the Volvo. The bags are sold for the world price rather than any British price, saving the average British family five, maybe six pence in a week. We could all donate this sum for the relief of distressed plastic bag makers in Telford, but I don't suppose any of us will. We're just happy to pay less, even if it's an amount too small to notice. To the manufacturer, it's not even a saving. There's a new world price, there's no appeal, and he has to match it. The supermarkets and the large shopping chains uh, are not paying any less than they would pay from many other sources. That's because the market price has been lowered by the Far Eastern manufacturing How market much? in the last 10 years. How much per bag? Mm, maybe as much as 20%. So that's what, about a third or a quarter of a penny per yes, bag? Yes, something in that area. Right. It's not us that's making the savings, it's the supermarket people who are making the savings. Well, okay, you're making the profits, um, aren't you? <clears throat> Well, we, we hope to maintain a profit by supplying them with both types of product, the UK-made product and the ones made here. For example, if you're doing a six-week promotion for some particular product and you want to put it on your carrier bag, 
you're not going to buy it in China. You're going to have to buy it locally. And there's two marketplaces, and we want to supply them both. The paddy fields of South China are rapidly being turned into factories by foreign investors who see governments as irrelevant at best and interfering at worst. With borders melting away, they can move their businesses wherever they wish, and they don't want government to get in the way. Like Greta Garbo, they much prefer to be left alone. Jobs are going where economically they can be made. We've already seen some of our Far Eastern suppliers move from Malaysia to India because costs in Malaysia are becoming too expensive. There are other markets behind. There's Vietnam coming along. Laos hopefully will become settled and open up. Maybe even Cambodia and so you go on. I'm not a politician. I'm a businessman. My job is to manufacture products, sell them to the person who needs them and make a profit out of it. That's what I'm trying to do. What would you say that the British government could do to facilitate the work of industry? We've had no real involvement with government in coming here. The government really haven't got in the way, haven't caused us a problem, haven't been a factor. Um, I, as a businessman, prefer it to remain that way. The global economy is seeking out the people of Xinhui at incredible speed. I first came to China in 1984, and the increase in people's prosperity has been astonishing. It's wonderful to see that these people now have the choice from uh, their earnings to, to buy openly in the stores. What they Shop they're selling Sony televisions, for example, right. which are just exactly the type that we'd expect to find in England. As the jewellery, the one we couldn't recognise is jewellery. This is a clearance sale of jade jewellery. Twelve years ago, that would have been inconceivable. Nobody wanted to buy what was offered in the empty shops and dingy markets. People generally are, are, are now dressing in brighter clothes and beginning to maybe wear the things that they for many years have made locally here. My favourite little key-making man here. The recycled trainers, huh? Maybe, uh... There's 80 percent of China reportedly has not yet seen any glimmer of economic development whatsoever. So there's an awful long way to go here. This area will grow and become as rich as Hong Kong in the years to come and they'll move on somewhere else.